yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, IPv6 transit and peering. Um, basically kind of the who, why, and what of uh, transit and peering. Um, so in two parts, basically, starting with kind of the relationships, peers, transit providers, the uh, agreements with them, and then getting into the technology of actually BGP peering, doing your eBGP sessions, and what BGP filtering you need to do at those sessions. Uh, so starting with the relationships, where there's several questions you're probably going to ask. Uh, who should you peer with? Who should you buy transit from? And then what the, should the agreements look like uh, with those peers and with those transit providers? And uh, the easy approach is to just peer with the people you already peer with on IPv4. Where you've already established these peering relationships. You've already set up your network. Um, you've already done all of the traffic monitoring and things like that to negotiate the deals. Um, so if you just go to them and turn up v6, it should be fairly easy, uh, and it should work fairly well, especially when you're starting out with just a trial. Uh, that'll give you connectivity into your network, um, and you can go from there. And the same thing with transit providers, right? You've already got somebody who you're buying upstream service from. Uh, if you just turn on IPv6 with them, it should be free. It shouldn't uh, require too much work, and so you can just move forward. Um, and then, again, the agreements should really start out the same. If you're doing a trial, you just want to get everything set up, you just want to get connectivity in, uh, and you want to just make it work. And then all of this can be revisited once IPv6 traffic levels pick up. So once you actually see the traffic patterns, you see what's coming in and going out, if IPv6 looks different than IPv4, uh, you, know, you can look at that and you can move it along. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if your transit provider today doesn't provide IPv6, that may be a reason to look for another transit provider. But other than that, uh, you can really just keep everything kind of the same, mirror it, set it all up, and move forward. Uh, and like I said, that's the easy way. Uh, this also could be a opportunity to enhance your peering footprint, right? So in IPv6, it's still fairly new to most people. Uh, a lot of folks uh, are just moving into IPv6, and there's a few networks that have taken advantage of this. They've really seized the opportunity to peer with people who wouldn't have peered with them in IPv4. Uh, as it's all just starting up and the traffic levels are low, you may be able to work out some deals that you couldn't have worked out in IPv4. And so this would be adding IPv6-only peers to your portfolio of what you have now of IPv4-only peers, and then, of course, hopefully moving most of your peers to dual stack and, and peering on both IPv4 and IPv6. So that's really the gist of, of the relationships, and I'd like to dig into kind of more of the technology, which is more of uh, what I'm comfortable with anyway. Um, so starting with just IPv6 BGP peering, I'm assuming uh, you're doing a trial, so this isn't a greenfield deployment. Uh, this is not uh, you know, just an IPv6-only network that you're setting up for the first time. So you already have eBGP and IBGP configured in your network. And assuming that, the first option would be to add IPv6 to your existing IPv4 peering. So you could use multi-protocol BGP and add the IPv6 network layer reachability information and just pass IPv6 routes along with the IPv4 routes on the existing session. Um, one thing to remember, when you add an address family, it does bounce the session, so you're going to take down your v4 session to do this. Also, you're tying IPv4 and IPv6 at the hip, uh, and there's a few other problems, so please don't do this. It's a very bad idea. It is possible, but uh, on ABGP especially, you're not going to want to do it. IBGP, within your network, there may be some cases where you may want to do something like this, but uh, not with your peers or your, or your upstreams at all. So the better answer is to use you know, a dual session, to have independent sessions, to set up a distinct IPv4 BGP peering session and a distinct IPv6 BGP peering session. Uh, and this does a few things. Um, one, you know, the main thing here is that it, it decouples the two topologies. So you have to remember that IPv4 and IPv6 are completely distinct protocols. They're not compatible on the wire. It's, it's a ships in the night situation. So um, you actually want your IPv4 and your IPv6 networks to be able to be distinct. You may end up having the exact same topology and the exact same traffic engineering in both, uh, but the fact remains that they are two separate logical networks sharing the same common physical infrastructure. Uh, the, the nice thing about this, if, when you have the two sessions set up, uh, is one, outages, right? So there's a chance if uh, you lose IPv6 connectivity, you don't necessarily lose IPv4 connectivity. Uh, if you're using an IPv4 peering session and transmitting IPv6 routes over it, and v6 connectivity goes away, you continue to advertise IPv6 routes, and they just, all the traffic gets dropped on the floor, you just black hole it all. If you have an actual v6 peering session, then when v6 connectivity goes away, you pull your v6 routes down, and hopefully you're multi-homed and it fails over as it should. Uh, the other thing is with maintenance. Um, you can take down v6, you can take down v4 without harming each other. And the last thing that I think often gets overlooked uh, is operational clarity. So when you have distinct IPv4 and IPv6 peering sessions, you can also group all of your prefix lists, your um, import and export filters, 
all of that stuff can be completely separated. So you can really look at you know, a silo of IPv6 config and a silo of IPv4 config. And uh, you know, when people are troubleshooting the network, folks that may not have that great of uh, experience with BGP and IPv6, or even IPv4 for that matter, or yourself when you get called at 3.30 in the morning uh, and you're bleary-eyed and trying to figure out what's going on in the network, it's a lot easier to figure out what's happening when there's distinct v4 and v6 policy, distinct v4 and v6 configurations. Uh, I've got uh, a Junos configuration example here of a v6 peer. Um, so again, one of the nice things um, in Junos is basically you just have an IPv6 neighbor and everything else looks the same as you would do it otherwise. Right? You've still got your 32-bit router ID, your AS number and the routing options, and then you can build these um, you know, BGP groups. And that's another thing that's, that's kind of nice here is when you have the group, so you'll probably already have a group set up for peers and a group set up for transit providers and a group set up um, you know, for customers or whatever the case may be, depending on how your topology is set up. And now you can just add a group for V6 peers. And again, it keeps it really distinct, it keeps it separate. You can have separate import and export policies. Uh, everything else can be completely distinct. Um, even if you're connecting with the same peers on the same routers, you can have this separate setup that keeps uh, that operational clarity. Uh, here's an iOS config example. And again, same thing, you still have your 32-bit router ID. Um, the no BGP default IPv4 unicast uh, is basically just exactly what it sounds like. It makes the uh, IPv4 unicast not the default for multi-protocol BGP. Because um, that's one thing that's interesting with uh, Cisco's implementation for IPv6 BGP. It's, it's all based on multi-protocol BGP. So even when you're doing distinct IPv4 and IPv6 sessions, it's actually set up as a multi-protocol BGP session. And so you get this address family, uh, IPv6, added, and then the neighbor inside of that. The reason it's interesting is that when you do that, right, you add this, neighbor, this address family, it actually splits your BGP config into three pieces. So there's an address family IPv4, an address family IPv6, and the, the core BGP config. Um, that can be fairly alarming when your config shifts around and everything changes and all of a sudden the config you're very familiar with looks completely different. Uh, I recommend that when you add IPv6, although it shouldn't have any effect on the V4 peering session that's already there, uh, it will change the config, it's gonna look different, especially if you have a really complex BGP config. It's a really good idea to do this during a maintenance window, uh, even though it really should be a zero risk operation. Definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, I threw up um, some session verification commands, just some troubleshooting stuff here. Um, I don't wanna go into too much detail here. A couple things to note on the, uh, in the Cisco stuff, there's some definite changes. So today, right, with IPv4, you're probably doing show IP BGP. Uh, they've reversed that, they switched it around, now it's show BGP IPv6. So you've added in this IPv6 command, and it's in a different place than it was before. That definitely catches some folks. Um, so showing some differences here of, of you know, what you're used to and, and what you're gonna have to learn uh, and remember to go back and forth, right? If you're looking at a V4 session, you need to remember to use the V4 commands and, and back and forth. So once you have your BGP session set up, one of the biggest pieces of peering is, is doing route filtering, right? You wanna make sure that you're only allowing the legitimate routes into your network uh, and, and acting on, on the correct routes. So uh, here again, you know, BGP is one place where V6 doesn't change the game that much. The methodology for filtering is still pretty much the same. Uh, you can have explicit route filters, you can have Vogon lists, Martian lists, um, maximum prefix limits, prefix size limits. Uh, but of course, the devil is in the details, right? So now you're dealing with IPv6 addresses instead of V4 addresses. The prefix sizes are different. Um, the Vogon lists are obviously different. Uh, your max prefix limits are gonna be totally different. Uh, so all this stuff you need to take into consideration as you're moving forward. Uh, the way I split it up here is, is into three kind of themes. So you're gonna filter routes coming from your customers if you're an ISP. And then whether you're an ISP or an enterprise, you're gonna need to filter routes from your peers and transits. And then you need to filter your own routes. So customer routes is, is fairly simple. You basically tell your customers to tell you what routes they have. They give you the LOA, letter of authorization that you know, shows that they use those routes, or you check in who is if they're you know, RIR assigned routes, and you filter them. Um, block everything else, and uh, then the nice thing is in IPv6, all the blocks should be a lot bigger. Everyone should have plenty of address space to go for a long time, so you probably don't have to update these very often. So having explicit route filters uh, becomes a little bit easier than it was in V4, just because you're probably not gonna have adding networks all the time. There is uh, kind of an open question today on, on some people's minds with uh, prefix size. So today, a lot of service providers will allow IPv4 routes all the way down to a slash 32 just for um, black holing and purposes like that. So a lot of service providers will have, you know, service provider AS, colon, colon, 666, and if you send a slash 32 route into my network with that, I'm gonna black hole traffic forward on my peers, which will stop a D, uh, DOS attack. 
So you're probably going to want to still do similar things like that. You probably want to allow more specifics from your customers. And, and again, these are your customers. They're paying you to carry their routes. So you probably want to accept whatever they're going to send you. Uh, if you're going to do that, make sure that you do have proper maximum prefix limits. You know, if, if a customer has a slash 24 or even, even a slash 12 in, in, in IPv4, and they announce a bunch of routes to you, they're probably not going to take down your router. It's, it, you know, it's going to cause you a headache, but it probably won't take down your router. If a customer has even a slash 64, and they were to announce all of their routes as slash 128s, that's going to probably cause some damage. So you absolutely want to make sure you have maximum prefix limits in place. Uh, and then again, if, if you are allowing anything from your customers, you're going to want to filter out probably everything smaller than a slash 48 before you announce it to your peers. Uh, you can use communities for that. You can just use sizes for that. Um, but obviously, you don't want to pass 128s out onto the internet because there's no reason. They'll just get dropped by your peers. Um, again, here's a quick example of just what uh, an iOS and, and a Junos um, config looks like. So there's a little bit of difference here. Obviously, it's an IPv6 prefix list, and you've got an IPv6 address. And then uh, in Junos policy, you've got family INET6. Other than that, everything works just how it does with IPv4. Um, so your peers and your upstreams. Hopefully, all of your peers and your transit providers are using a internet routing registry. And you can just dynamically create explicit filters based on that. They keep the IR updated. You automatically update new filters once a day or a couple times a day. And everything just works great. Um, if, if your upstreams are not using route filters, um, you should probably, I mean, if they're not using an IRR, you should probably ask them to. Um, but there is cases where, where folks aren't. And so that's where you come to just a bogon filter and a max prefix limit. Um, again, there's some places in the world where there's not an IRR available. Some people aren't using them. Some people don't update them well enough. So you may end up doing that. Uh, the note here is that uh, your max prefix limits are going to change fairly rapidly with IPv6, probably faster than they do with v4, uh, because there's new networks, especially from your transit providers. So there's new networks are getting lit up, right? We're turning up the IPv6 internet as we speak. And so these numbers are growing rapidly. So you need to just keep an eye on that. So looking at uh, the IPv6 bogons and Martians, um, this is kind of a list. Obviously, there's, there's more to it than this. There's other IETF reserved addresses. There's other things that you might want to consider. These are most of the ones that either are in use currently or have been in use in the past, and so could be active routes that you might actually see in the wild. Uh, actually, obviously, 2000 colon colon slash 3 is the global unicast space, and so you're going to want to allow that. The rest of these are pretty much denies. A couple of interesting cases here is the Teredo and the 6 to 4 space. Um, so Teredo is 2001 slash 32, and 6 to 4 is 2002 slash 16. Those are routes that you're going to want to accept unless you're trying to block those protocols, uh, but you don't want to see any more specifics. So you probably want to do an allow for that exact space and then not allow anything more specific because you don't want anybody to hijack that traffic um, for any reason. Some of the other things on here, 3FFE is the former 6 phone space. You shouldn't be seeing that anymore. Uh, obviously, the link local unicast, the former site local, uh, un unique local, and multicast addresses are all stuff that uh, you don't want to see. Oh, and then 2001 DB8, the documentation addresses, shouldn't be seeing those on the internet. Uh, also, colon colon slash 8, it covers the loopback space, uh, IPv4 mapped addresses, IPv4 compatible addresses, um, the null route, all that stuff is in there, so you probably don't want to see any of that on your network. And again, I, I put together kind of a quick example of, of a loose, what I call a loose bogon filter for uh, iOS. Um, it, it's basically just a IPv6 prefix list based on that table we just saw on the last slide. Um, again, like I said, the, you can see in there, there's the, um, this one, the uh, 6 to 4 space and the uh, Teredo space are allowed at the exact, but then denied anything less than. Uh, the 2000 slash 3 space is allowed down to a 48. Uh, one thing on here, you want to filter your own routes. You don't want to see your own routes coming back in from your peers or from the internet. And um, then, of course, the kind of the, the default deny at the end of the prefix list. This is exactly the same filter, but just written uh, in policy form for Junos. And again, your own prefix added in there. Some people want to be a little bit more paranoid, and they want to actually do a strict bogon filter or a strict Martian filter. 
Uh, obviously, not all of 2000 slash 3 is actually in use. Not all of it's even been handed out to the RIRs. In fact, a very small portion of it has been handed down to RIRs, and even less of that's been handed out by RIRs. So you can look at the IANA lists and see what space has actually been given down to the RIRs, and you could filter just allowing those in instead of allowing all of 2000 slash 3. Uh, there's also other prefixes that are probably considered BOGON. Team Simru keeps a full BOGON list of, of all the space, all the IETF reserved space, all the IANA reserved space, everything that you shouldn't be seeing. So you could deny all of that space. Uh, and then also, RIRs hand out different space in different sizes. So ISPs get bigger blocks out of a s set range of space, and end users get smaller blocks out of a set range of space. So you could, if you wanted to um, not allow folks to deaggregate their space, you can filter on those actually what's coming out of the RIRs. Uh, the thing to remember with strict filtering, right, is all of this is changing. It's all a moving target. IANA is constantly handing out more space to the RIRs. The RIRs change their policy. They hand out more space. Um, Bogons change. If you're doing strict filters, you're really going to have to stay on top of it. Uh, and this is probably something you don't want to do. The other thing to think about is what happens when the next guy comes along. When you leave your job and there's a guy who has to come in behind you, does he want to have to keep up with this? Does he even understand what you're doing here? So it, it's a possibility you can definitely do it. Um, I'd probably recommend against doing it this way. You just stick with the loose filters. And then, of course, you've got your own routes to filter. So this is fairly simple. You want to allow your routes and your customers' routes out to your peers and transit providers. Uh, you don't want to deaggregate unnecessarily. So we definitely want to keep everything shorter than a slash 48. So 48's and bigger. And then again, only use the aggregation as absolutely needed, right? And one way to kind of control this is with communities. So you can use communities to determine level of hierarchy within your network. So where you've got your routes nailed up, you can use different communities. Um, and then you can easily filter out more specifics that aren't needed if you know there's a, a, a route above it in the hierarchy. Uh, based on the type of customer. So if you have a customer who's doing BGP with you, they're probably multi-homed. Their routes probably need to be announced because, you know, down to what they're actually sending you. Uh, whereas a customer who you've got a static route to probably doesn't need to have their s more specific route announced out to the internet. Um, and then use, right? So your infrastructure prefixes, things like that, you don't need to announce the more specifics in those places. And then the other thing that can be kind of interesting is you can do locational tagging with communities. So you can, if you want to allow more specifics out in, a certain re in their own region, and then just do the aggregate on the other side to kind of traffic engineer your network. Um, none of this is very different from before, again but all of it becomes a little bit more important when you're dealing with so many more addresses. And then just kind of a few parting thoughts here. Um, one thing is, you know, V6 is kind of nice. You're basically rolling out a completely new logical network onto your existing infrastructure. And so you really have a chance to do it right from the beginning. So, you know, use an IRR. You can register in an existing database. You can set up your own database. Um, Make sure you're actually synchronizing your own filters with the RIR. So if you're using IRR for your customers, then you can build your customer filters off the IRR, and that way you're sure that it's actually working. Um, an IPAM solution, some kind of uh, IP address management, is probably necessary with IPv6. You're dealing with octillions of addresses, right? I mean, even tens and tens of thousands of subnets. So you're probably going to need something to take care of. You know, just a spreadsheet's not going to work anymore. You probably need some kind of comprehensive IPAM solution uh, something that ties into DNS and DHCP is superior. Um, things that do SWIP for you automatically, that can do address, uh, you know, architectures and things in them, obviously a plus. Uh, working with the address space, just because it's so big, uh, having some help there will be good. Uh, I think there's a few sponsors that might be able to help with that. And then um, just consider registering in the peering DB. If, uh, if you want to peer with people, they need to know that you're out there. I threw in a few references to kind of take this further for those of you that kind of want to look into this more. Um, there's some slides here that uh, myself, Aaron Hughes, and Ken Sexton presented at the Rocky Mountain V6 Task Force Summit um, this, earlier this year that go through fairly comprehensively BGP configuration, both for um, in Junos and, Cis uh, and Cisco iOS uh, config, uh, and kind of all the caveats there in a much more detail. Uh, there's route filtering, so I've got uh, a link to Team Simru's um, IPv6 routers um, page, which has links out to their suggested filters and, and packet filters and things like that. Also, um, Gert During has a IPv6 filters set up, um, which gives some good information. It's a little bit dated now, but it's very close to exactly the examples I gave today. 
Uh, and then also for IRRs, right? So there's IRR.net, which is put up by Merit, and then ISC has a really nice um, IRR tool set which you can use to help generate prefixes or prefix filters and things from the uh, IRR database. And that's all I have unless there's questions. Go ahead. Thanks. All right. All right, thank you.